Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Today we'll be going over the best parts, the most mind-blowing aspects of Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods. Now this book is a staple for anyone who wants to learn more about the history of humanity and the history of human civilizations. It's a decently thick book, so let's go over what I believe to be the best, most mind-blowing parts of it. Now, the first aspect I'd like to highlight would be the Perry Reese map, which is a genuine document, not a hoax of any kind, which was made at Constantinople in A.D. 1513. It's a map that focuses on the western coast of Africa, the eastern coast of South America, and the northern coast of Antarctica, which makes absolutely no sense. Because the Perry Re- because Perry Reese could not have acquired this information from contemporary explorers because Antarctica remained undiscovered until 1818, more than 300 years after Perry Reese drew this map. What's really weird also in the Perry Reese map is Queen Maudland is shown as an ice-free coastline. However, geological evidence confirms that the latest date that Queen Maudland could have been an ice-free coastland would be 4000 BC. So in other words, the true enigma of this 1513 map is not so much its inclusion of a continent not discovered until 1818, but its portrayal of part of the coastline of that continent under ice-free conditions, which came to to an end 6,000 years ago and has not since recurred. So how can this be explained? Well, Perry Reese actually gives the answer in a series of notes written in his own hand on the map itself. He tells us that he was not responsible for the original surveying and cartography. On the contrary, he admits that his role was merely that of a compiler and copyist, and that the map was derived from a large number of source maps. I mean, people forget that a huge chunk of human history was destroyed during the burning of the Library of Alexander that happened in 48 BC, which was, I would argue to say, the majority of written human history at that time, also with a lot of cartography and a lot of maps were transcribed at that library. We have lost a ton of information about our past. So it should come as no surprise that enigmatic maps like the Perry Rees map are going to pop up from time to time that don't explain or fit in with contemporary history because of events like the burning of the Library of Alexander and many other conquerors burning written history and artifacts. So anyways, Fingerprint fingerprint of the Gods goes on to explain scientifically how scientists know that Antarctica was actually glacier-free about 6,000 years ago, using something called ionium dating, developed by Dr. W.D. Urey, which makes use of three different radioactive elements found in seawater. Researchers at the Carnegie Institute in Washington, D.C., were able to establish beyond any reasonable doubt that great rivers carrying fine-grained, well-assorted sediments had indeed flowed in Antarctica until about 6,000 years ago. Just as another map, the Orontius Phineas map, has also showed, which is another map that's highlighted in the Fingerprint of the Gods, which shows another map of Antarctica with rivers flowing inside of it which again is unexplainable by contemporary historians. So scientists confirmed that after around the date of 4000 BC, we see glaciers or glacial sediment begin to be deposited at the Ross Sea, which is the ocean, the sea covering Antarctica. So science has confirmed that large glaciers did not form in Antarctica until about 4000 BC. And then we look and we see a few ancient maps that show ancient people discovering Antarctica with flowing rivers. Can you even begin to imagine the amazing discoveries archaeologists could find in Antarctica if they were actually able to dig below the snow and the ice? All right, so on to the next amazing point. In Peru, just north of Cusco, there is an amazing ancient structure, a fortress called Sacsayhuaman. This ancient fortress actually predates the Incas, who lived in this area once the Spanish conquistadors came in and started keeping historical records. One conquistador reported something interesting in his Royal Commentaries of the Incas. He gave an account of how, in historical times, an Inca king had tried to emulate the achievements of his predecessors who had built Sacsayhuaman, 
Um, the, the attempt had involved bringing just one immense boulder from several miles away to add to the existing fortifications. This boulder was hauled across the mountain by more than 20,000 Indians going up and down very steep hills. At a certain point, it fell from their hands over a precipice, crushing more than 3,000 men on the boulders way down from the cliff. In all the histories that uh, Graham Hancock says he surveyed, this was the only report which described the Incas actually building or trying to build with huge blocks like those employed at Sasco Sasuke Waman, and that's me attempting to pronounce it, even as a Spanish miner. Uh, the report suggested that they possessed no experience of the techniques involved and that their attempts had ended in disaster. Yeah, that's just another interesting thing that I forgot about until I read Fingerprint of the Gods is that the ancient civilizations of the Aztecs, of the Incas, they never even claimed to be the ones who built these amazing ziggurats and fortresses that they built their civilizations around. They attribute these structures to even earlier civilizations that weren't exactly actually the Aztecs, the Mayas, or the Incas. They didn't build these amazing ancient structures, according to them. In fact, you know that famous Mayan calendar everyone talks about? Well, Graham Hancock explains in this book, that was not created by the Mayans. That was created by a predecessor of the Mayans, a civilization known as the Olmecs meaning the rubber people. And of course, that's not even what those people refer to themselves as. That's just what the Mayans referred to them as, the Olmecs. That wasn't even their original name. That's how little we know about this ancient civilization that made something as advanced as the Mayan calendar. All right, so another really weird and amazing thing that Graham Hancock, Graham Hancock talks about in his book was how the ancient Maya talked about the legend of dwarves. Um, the ancient Mayans have a period called a pyramid called the Pyramid of the Magician, which was attributed to being constructed by ancient dwarves. But this Pyramid of the Magician was by no means unique in being associated with the supernatural powers of dwarves, whose architectural and masonry skills were widely renowned in Central America. Uh, construction work, this is a quote by some Mayans, construction work was easy for them, asserted one typical Maya legend. All they had to do was whistle, and heavy rocks would move into place. This is weird, because a very uh, similar tradition claimed that the gigantic stone blocks of the mysterious Andean city of Tiwanaku had been carried through the air to the sound of a trumpet. And an interesting side note to this, I remember seeing a video and an article in a mainstream science publication about how scientists figured out how to use acoustic waves in order to levitate very lightweight objects. You can go on YouTube yourself and check these videos out where scientists use acoustic waves to move like little marbles. And some people, they're confused when they see these videos because they think that it's the air from the subwoofers moving these marbles, but it's not the air from the subwoofers. Don't be confused by that. It's literally acoustic waves that are levitating these marbles in the videos. I also thought that it was honestly air from subwoofers too until I looked into it. I mean, this is obviously speculation, but this could account for how ancient civilizations somehow move these giant boulders that we can't even move, move around today at least not in, in an organized fashion enough to build sophisticated pyramids. It's pretty arrogant to assume that just because our science hasn't discovered or perfected this technology yet doesn't mean that it's hocus pocus nonsense. I mean, that would put you in the same camp as people who thought that the telephone would never take off or that the internet would never be a thing. All right, so another thing highlighted in Graham Hancock's book, which is just, it's just a weird overlap of different cultures, is um, the question of Venus a planet that was of immense symbolic importance to all the ancient peoples of Central America, who identified it strongly with Quetzalcoatl, who was the plumed serpent. Unlike the ancient Greeks, but like the ancient Egyptians, the Maya understood that Venus was both the morning star and the evening star. The Greeks only considered Venus the morning star. But still, interestingly enough, who else is considered to be called the morning star? But Satan, Lucifer... Lucifer is also known as the morning star, just like Venus. And then, you know, I'm not going to go into this here, but for those of you who are well read in this subject, you understand the similarities between, you know, the serpent and Lucifer, too. So that's very odd. 
But another great question that I've had in the past, which I'm sure many more of you two have also had the same question, is what did the ancients think that the pyramids were used for? Well, Central American traditions collected in the 16th century by Father Bernardino de Saguan gave eloquent expression to a widespread belief that Teotihuacan had fulfilled at least one specific and important religious function in ancient times. Teotihuacan, of course, being a pyramid in Mexico. And according to these legends, the city of the gods was so known because the lords therein buried after their deaths did not perish but turned into gods. In other words, it was the place where men became gods. It was additionally known as the place of those who had the road of the gods and the place where gods were made. So is this a coincidence that Hancock wonders that this seems to have been the religious purpose of the three pyramids also at Giza? Because the hieroglyphs of the pyramid text, the oldest coherent body of writing in the world, left little room for doubt that the ultimate objective of the rituals carried out within the colossal structures of the pyramids was to bring about the deceased pharaoh's transfiguration to throw open the doors of the firmament and to make a road so that he might ascend into the company of gods. And you know, this is what a lot of people believe is the purpose of being on earth. This is like a boot camp. This is a training ground for us to basically evolve onto the next level. So not only do we see a pattern of these ancient pyramids being used for religious purposes for pharaohs and other people to transmute into gods, but so too are the layouts of these sacred sites incorporated with the celestial stars with the Milky Way. In fact, the pyramids of Giza are laid out in the same way that the constellation of Orion is. As above, so below. We see the same kind of thing used at the Mayan sites too. So I leave you with that as something to think about. That wraps up this segment. Tune in for part two of the most interesting parts of Fingerprints of the Gods. When I actually finish the entire book, I'm like, I'm like halfway through right now. And that's what I got. Take care. I'll see you soon.